O oh, Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the privilege of being in your house and to be a church family together in Christ. We pray that you will bless us now and as we come to the time of study, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've missed you dearly. <laughs> I don't think you missed us as much as we can miss you. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Now they had to put up with me. Is that it? <laughs> well, that was a good thing. That was a good thing. <laughs> it's been almost a month. It's been almost it's a month yeah. since we have been able to stay. We've missed you, Brother Bill. I've missed hearing your comments and all the faces, the lovely faces that are here with us now. Uh, God blessed us you in our she time. she said lovely faces and pointed that way. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, so you have, a, you have a strong face, not a lovely face. <laughs> I, don't, I won't say you had a lovely face, but you have a, you have a nice strong face. You know? <laughs> You're looking like a prophet, too, with, with, the, with the beard there. Uh, but it has been such a tremendous blessing. God bless us in our time of way, and we appreciate your prayers. We could feel the prayers. Uh, God's blessing with us in our Bible conference that we had every year. And by God's grace, hopefully we'll set it up to where the entire church can come at the exact time. So we're working on things to, to make a blessing for all of us. By the grace of God. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Malachi. What book did I say? Malachi. We're going to Malachi chapter 3. Are you ready to study this morning? Yes. You've, been, you've been studying deeply for four weeks, no question. But we have to study deeper today. I, I'm telling you that in four weeks' time, it's almost like six months of studies have transpired. And we are behind in our studies. Things are happening so rapidly that, uh, that I want to get back and share with us what's going on. Are you ready to study this? I don't sound like you're ready yet. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> you're going to Malachi chapter 4. Now, we have studied and we have found that unless there is a particular type of change in us, when the test comes, we will never be ready. Every time that a person is tested, there's a preparation for a test. Am I right? If a man is going through mathematics, there's math tests. If a man is going through chemistry, there's chemistry tests. If he's going through law, there are legal tests. Uh, no matter what field the man is in, that if he's going to do something proficient, there has to be a test. And if we're going to be a part of God's kingdom forever, God has to test us. And we found that unless there is a radical change, what type of change? Radical. Unless there's a radical change, we will never be prepared for the test. And so we've been studying down the lines for several months about an understanding of this. Now, on the screen, I have a picture that everybody's familiar with. We'll better understand as we get into our study. But what picture is that? What does it say? Talk to me, somebody. The handwriting is on the wall. Do you believe that? Oh, yes. I believe that with all my heart. Now, we want to go a little further in our study in Malachi chapter 3. Now, before Jesus came to the earth the first time, did he have to do something? Or could, could he just come the first time? When Jesus came the first time to this earth, did he have to do something before he came the first time or could he just come anytime he wanted? Did he have to do something first? We're going to find out he had to do something first from the scripture. And we're going to find that just as God had to do something the first time before he came, he must do something the second time before he comes. Now look at Malachi chapter 3 and let's notice from scripture what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. You're there, amen? Let's look at it together. What does the Bible say? It says... Behold, I will send, what everybody? My messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So he said, before I come, I'm going to send somebody first. Who was God going to send before he came the first time? What does the Bible say? No, did the Bible not say John? <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. Now, the reason why I say that, you see, it's, it's, not, it's not safe for us to just read something into the scripture, even though we, we may be right. But it's clear to stay exactly what the Bible says. That's why this training is called not Church Training Institute or Pastor Training Institute. It's called what? Bible, Bible training. training Institute. So that everything we believe comes from the Word of God. Do you know that all Seventh-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. And so if a man will accept the Bible, he would become a Seventh-day Adventist. The problem is that we have lost an understanding of the Bible. And what we have to do when we go to every nation, kindred, and people is not say, let's make everybody seven Adventists. We want to make persons believers in the Bible. Yes. And by believing the Bible, the natural result is seven Adventists. 
It's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in the word of God. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. You don't have to make anything up. So in Malachi chapter 3, before Jesus came, the first time, the Bible says that he sent what before he came? He sent a what? A messenger. And what was the messenger supposed to do, according to scripture? So that messenger, his work was not to work miracles. That was not the work of the messenger. In fact, you don't read of a miracle in which John the Baptist wrought. Do you read of a miracle in which he wrought? No. And yet he's called the greatest prophet. Now, my brothers and sisters, we read that before Christ came, there would have to come a messenger, and that messenger's job, you can sum it up in one word. What was it to do? Talk to me. Prepare. So before Jesus could come, there had to be a work of preparation. Jesus could not come until he had prepared his people for his coming. Did John do that, yes or no? Oh, yeah. He did. In fact, go to Luke chapter 7. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, you will notice that the New Testament quotes this Old Testament passage that we just read in Malachi. Everything we read in the Old Testament, we read in the New Testament. It's the same scripture. Look at Luke chapter 7. And notice what the Bible says now in Luke 7, beginning in verse 27. Luke chapter 7 and verse 27. Are you there, amen? Let's read verse 27 together. Speaking of John, you can read John in verse 24. Look at verse 24. It says, and when the messengers of John, that's 24. Well, what did, what did Jesus say about John? Verse 27. The Bible says, this is he. Who is that? Talking about John. John is he of whom it is written, what? Behold, I send my messenger. Now, where, did, did, where was it written that he sent his messenger? Where do we read that? Where? Malachi. Malachi. Now, the church, or, or rather the, uh, uh, the, the, the disciples of Christ, they didn't have Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. They had Genesis to Malachi. So when Jesus said it was written, he wasn't talking about the New Testament. He was saying that in the scriptures, the ancient scriptures, it had already been written this, and we found where it was. It says, this is he of whom it was written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall, there's that word again, what's the word, talk to me. Prepare. Prepare thy way before thee. So that tells us that before Jesus came the first time, his work was to send a messenger who could prepare that way. Question. Is Jesus going to come back a second time? Yes. Then what must happen before Jesus comes the second time? Before he comes the second time, what again must he send? Talk to me, somebody. A messenger. You know that the remnant church represents these messengers those three angels represent these messengers, these angels that are to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, what is the messenger supposed to do? Talk to me, somebody. The messenger is supposed to do what? Prepare us. Now, if we're not getting prepared, then we're not listening to the messenger. Now, preparation means that there has to be some type of radical change. There has to be some changes inside of us to prepare us. If a man said a hurricane was coming to certain parts of the country where hurricanes come often and then a messenger is sent to tell them a hurricane is coming so that they can prepare for the hurricane, what do they do? If they're intelligent, do they do the same thing they've always been doing? What happens to the windows? Well, they start boarding up the windows. What happens to their waters? And they start trying to gather the waters, trying to make sure they have something in case of an emergency. So there's a work of preparation. So my brothers and sisters, if a messenger tells us that a crisis is coming, there should be seen in the world and in the church who have the messenger a preparation. And if the preparation is not taking place, then it means that we're not really listening to the messenger. And if the messenger is not being listened to, we'll be ready for the coming of Jesus. Jesus said that when John came, he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I want to be made ready. What do you say? Amen. And if ever there was a time to get ready, it's right now. I want to read this to us before we really get going this morning. We're really getting ready to study. We have some tremendous things to study. I'm, I'm telling you, the things I, if, if, if it were not for Jesus, it would be frightening what we're getting ready to study. Now, my brothers and sisters, go to the book of James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now, you know that for the last couple of months, we've been studying on this subject, the ribbon of blue. The ribbon of what? Blue. We're still in that subject, the ribbon of blue, but we're taking a little parenthetical study today because we've been gone for almost a month. You know, if you have an engine 
and the engine has not been warmed up, and you start the engine cold, you know what normally happens? It's hard to start up. <laughs> you start to cut. <laughs> it's, not, it's not cutting off properly. You know what you have to do to that engine? If it's a small engine, what do you do to it first? Choke it. You choke it. <laughs> now, this is a small church, so you know what I have to do to the church? <laughs> 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 now I didn't say it. You t- you said it. <laughs> so if I come over and choke you, don't 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 feel. Free. If you if you're a visitor and I choke you, don't don't worry about it. Just you just think of yourself as an engine. Amen. <laughs> no, but so we got to get choked. Now the purpose of the choking is not to kill the engine, though. It would almost sound like it if you didn't know anything about engine. You say you choke it, then it must be you must be killing it. But the purpose of the choking is actually to get the engine going, to make it run more smoothly. And then you take the choke off and it purrs like a kitten. Am I right? And so, my brothers and sisters, what must I do if I'm going to be a good mechanic, um, a a good spiritual, ministerial mechanic? What must I do to you this morning? I got to choke you. You ready to be choked? All right, let me choke you. Now, spirit, 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 spirit. (laughs) spiritual. Make sure sure that thing's spiritual. (laughs) All right. We're in James 4. I'm going to give you a text in just a moment. I want to read some things. And I, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. There, there is a gap. What did I say? A gap. Now, what is a gap? I'm not talking about a store when I say gap. What, am I, what do I mean by a gap? What do I mean? A break. A There's a space. A space. Now, I'm going to put something. I'm, I'm going to show you this space in just a moment. Now, in this first space over here, I'm going to put no. What am I putting? No. Now, I'm talking about preparation. What the work of the messenger is. Now, that word is no. What does that mean when you're talking about know something? Understand. You understand? You're aware of? You have a knowledge of it? You know. Now, I'm going to put over here another word. Do. What's the first word? Yeah. No, that's not the first word. No. 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 That's the first word. I put that one. That's the first. No. What's the second word? Yeah. Do. Now, the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Not know his commandments. Now, if you know these things, happy if you do them. John 13, 17. Now, there is a blessing to knowing because if you don't know, it's almost impossible to do. But knowing is only half of the battle. Knowing is only part. And knowing by itself may not produce happiness. But if we know and do, it produces happiness. Now, I want to ask you a question. If I do not do... What I know, there's a gap. If I do not do, what did I say, Shalom? If I do not what? Do. What I know, there is a gap. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This gap is why we'll be lost. This gap is why we don't know God. This gap right here. Somebody says, well, there's so many things I don't know. That's not why you don't know God. That's, why, that's, not, not, that's not why we don't have a friendship with Jesus. You know that a man, even if he didn't know anything, all of, so much things, he can begin developing a relationship with God. Am I right? Yeah. So my brothers and sisters, the reason why a man will be lost because he does not know God is not based on the fact that he does not have a bunch of information. That's not it. The reason why a man will be lost is not because of what he does not know. If a man does not know something, he'll never be lost for it. That's a fair guy. That's a just God. That's a, a, a wonderful God. But now, my brothers and sisters, but if I know something, and by God's grace I will not do what I know, what is that gap call in the Bible? What is that gap call in the Bible? The Bible calls that sin. The Bible calls that gap sin. Now, we may not call it sin, but the study is not we training institute. The study is Bible training institute. Institute, BTI. Now, notice what the Bible says. Someone said, you're making that? No, 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 let's read from the Bible. See, it's a wonderful thing when you don't have to make up anything. You just read what the Word of God says. Look at James 4, and let us read verse 17 together. You're there, amen? Yeah. Oh, Heavenly Father, please anoint your Word. We've opened it. I sense your presence, Lord. We want to know you. Please help us in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. James 4, verse 17. Let's read that together. The Bible says, Therefore, to him that... Knoweth, there's that word no, to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now notice it didn't say it's sin. It says to him it is sin. Now brothers and sisters, there are things that people do not know. 
And they're doing something that's wrong. You know, there are people that do not know that seven days is the Sabbath. Do you know that God does not account it as sin to them because they do not know it? But there are those that do know the seven days of the Sabbath and somehow just feel better staying at home watching television than going to church. The Bible calls that sin. Now, does sin affect our relationship and friendship with God? Yes or no? Sin does not get me closer to God. You know, I don't know how many can think this. Don't worry. We can sin. Everything's all right. Sin does not bring us closer to Jesus. Sin does what? Separates. And the more we sin, the further we get from God. Salvation is dependent upon having a close and intimate and personal relationship with Jesus. That's what salvation is built upon. Salvation is built upon a relationship with Christ. But if my relationship is severed, if there's a disconnect between me and Christ, there is no salvation for such a man. Do you see? That's as plain as crystal. Life is Jesus. If I'm connected to Christ, I have life. If I'm disconnected from Christ, I'm dead. Does it make sense? So what we're trying to understand and bring to the world is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What we're trying to bring to the Catholic and to the Baptist and to the Methodist and to the world is a way where a man can get so close to Christ that nothing can come in between. That's our message. That is the third angel's message. That is the biblical understanding of the Bible. Bring the man to Jesus. Now, why do we then have to preach against sin? Because sin does what? Separates us from Jesus. And the day of atonement, the day of at one meant, the final day of the sanctuary is to bring God and man back together. This is the message of Seventh-day Adventism. This is the message of the Bible. This is the message of God. This is the message. I want that. What do you say? Amen. I want this experience with Jesus. Now, but if, there, if I know something and I will not do something, that gap is what? Talk to me. Now, at this church, we've been learning. Am I right or wrong? Yes. BTI, we've been learning. Have you learned things you've never heard before, yes or no? Amen. And have you seen it directly from the Bible? Yes. You remember the study we had? We showed that Lucifer was the first homosexual? Yes. Now, what other church have you ever gone to? And they showed you from the Bible that he was, that's where homosexuality came from. No. But we saw it from the Bible. Am I right? Yes. We saw many things in diet and health and dress and music and worship and living. Upon Jesus, the sanctuary, God, redemption. We went through the Bible. We've been studying from Genesis to Revelation for several months. In fact, before COVID-19 hit in 2020, did we not talk about it was coming in this church? Yes or no? Yeah. Now, my brothers and my sisters, but there are things not just of what is coming, but there is a work of preparation that we studied about. Now, if we know something about how to prepare and we do not do it, whether it's in diet or music or dress or worship, the Bible calls it, talk to me. Now, we may not like to call it that, but the Bible does. You know, the fashionable minister who's paid a lot of money and sometimes afraid to tell you the truth in the church, he may change his message and make you think that what is fashionable, if it's all right, as long as you pay him a good salary, he'll tell you, well, it's not sin. Maybe not so good, but, you know, as long as you love Christ, it's all right. But Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep, Keep my commandments. commandments. He's given us direction. He's given us instruction so that the man may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work so that we can have a relationship with Christ. So now, my brothers and sisters, the true message must show us that if we know something, we should do it. Now, can we do it without Christ? No. How do you know? Says the Bible says. <laughs> you know, my brother, what I'm going to say to you. Now, if we, if we were just at the church, and I might say that's all right. But at Bible Training Institute, you got to give me what? Bible. Bible. Does the Bible say so? Yes. It does. What does it say so? That's what it says. In John 15, 5, it says, without me, ye can do nothing. So none of this can we do apart from Christ. Even when we learn something, we need Jesus to carry it out. We need Jesus with us all the time. We can never say, well, I learned enough. Now let me put Jesus to the side. No, sir. No, ma'am. We must have him with us all the time if we're going to get it done. What do you say? Amen. I like that. I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not upset at that. I'm, I like that. I need him. Do you, you need him? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're good enough you don't need him. <laughs> but I need him. Now, my brothers and sisters, the reason why I say so is because we've been studying some things in many things, in diet, but particularly in these last couple of months, we've been studying about dress, dress reform. And we studied from the Bible several things. And if we learn it, you know what we should do? When we learn something about health, what do we do? Do it. We learn something about dress, what do we do? We do it. Now, listen, if we do not do it, what good is it to know it if we do not do it? How can we use it? Someone says, well, I know it now, so I'll just tell the other churches. 
How are we going to go to a Sunday church and tell them uh, what they should be doing and we're not doing it? You know what you call that? Hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. How can we tell our children do something and as parents, guess what? Oh, child, you should be drinking water. You know water is good for your body. And then the child is looking at you and saying, but parents, you're not drinking. I'll never forget the, the, the daughter who was taught. She was taught that a plant-based diet was the best diet. This is what she was taught by her parents. And then one day she was, got in trouble, started smoking somewhere, and they found out about it, and, and they suspended her, and she somehow was home. And so she snuck into her mother's car. The mother didn't know it. And she went to work with the mother and was doing her thing. And I know this because that little girl came and stayed with us for a little while because she was in trouble. And she told us the story of what caused her to be in the condition she was in before she went back home. And she said it alarmed her. It hurt her. She said she was there in the car and she was there all day. And she knew what time my mother got off work. So just before her mother got ready to get off work, she jumps back into the car, back seat, to go back home with the mother. And the mother never knew it. So she's in the back seat. She's driving home and the mother is on her way home. And the mother, just before she gets home, she sees a Kentucky Fried Chicken on the way home oh, no. and pulls into KFC. Oh, wow. Not to put air in the tire. <laughs> but it was the bucket. A bucket of nuggets. nuggets. And she ordered it. She did. The, the daughter heard her. I'll take two sides and she put the order out. And the daughter's in the back. <laughs> and all of a sudden the mother starts driving and starts eating mm. the chicken off the bone tossing the bone brother Bill out the window mm. just before she gets home she stops off at a trash can throws the evidence away mm. grease all over her mouth mm. but throws the evidence away and then she gets into the house and the daughter is stunned paralyzed. The daughter doesn't move. She just stays in the car. She goes into the, uh, the, the, the what do you call it thing? Garage. garage. The, the garage door comes down. She goes into the house. The daughter stays there for a little while. Gets out. Goes into the front door. Comes into the house. Comes down from the, the, the upstairs in the room. Comes out. Mom, how you doing? Oh, oh I'm home. Oh, you're home? Oh, good to see you, Mom. You're home? Yes. Where you been? Oh, I just came back from work. Well, we're getting ready to eat. Are you, are you hungry? Did you eat anything? Oh, no, I didn't have any yet. I'm, I'm ready to eat. <laughs> now, upon the adding of the dishelpful practice, now what's added upon it now? Lies. Lies. Now, what does the daughter see? Lies. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You didn't have anything, mother? No, 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 I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything. That little girl said that destroyed everything her mother tried to teach her for, the, for the, her whole life. How much can you believe of mother now? You knew this? You're, you're practicing something different than what you know. How many homes does this happen in? With television, with video games, with movies, with so many other things that you can name across the list. And my brothers and sisters, it destroys the child's experience. And we're told to message young people. And message young people, you know what we're told? We're told that the greatest problems to destroy the love of Christ and the Bible and our young people is not that they just don't love the Bible. It's because they see the double standard of hypocrisy. If we are going to prepare people for the coming of the Lord, it must start in our homes. Elijah must come and turn the hearts of parents to children. Amen. Our families are not ready. Amen. And the work of preparation has to start not in the world and in the community, not even in the church. You know, the work of preparation must start talking to somebody in the home. And like Joshua says, as for me and I, we will serve the Lord. In the book, uh, in Review and Herald, September 27, 1892, not watch what the prophet says. It says, many are singing what? Talk to me, somebody. Beautiful songs in the meeting. What are they doing? They're singing what? Beautiful. 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 Tell me some beautiful songs. All to Jesus, I, I surrender. I, I'm, I'm climbing up the upper way. Uh, new heights I'm gaining what? Yeah, Every day. Hey. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming. <laughs> many are singing beautiful songs in the meeting. Songs of what they will do and what they mean to do. Remember, there's a difference between knowing and doing, right? It says, but some do not do these things. They do not sing with the spirit and the understanding also. So in the reading of the word, word of God, some are not benefited. Why? Because the Bible is not good? Because they do not take it into their very life. They do not what? Practice. So what 
causes the Bible to bless us is when we obey what it says. There's blessings and cursings in the Bible. When we obey his commands by the power of God, bless. When we disobey the commands by the power of God, curse. It says, if we do not practice it, we listen to the presentation of truth, BTI. It is all good. Oh, I loved it. But do we listen to it as we do to a pleasant song or receive it as the voice of God to us and obey his precepts? Many go away after listening how to the what? Most solemn messages of truth and pursue the same careless, unsanctified course they did how? You understand what that's saying? We can listen to a burning appeal. In diet and dress and music and worship and life and preparation. And then we leave the church and say, man, that was powerful. And then go home and eat the same thing. Go home and wear the same thing. Go home and listen to the same music. Go home and live the same way between husband and wife and parents and children and young people. How can we go on and think we're going to be blessed that way? I told you I got to choke you this morning. Now, my brothers and sisters, what I'm telling us is in order for us to go forward, it's not enough just to keep getting information, information, information. Whatever we learn to know, we must say, God, help me to do it. To do it. Not tomorrow. Not next Sabbath. When? Yeah. Now is the acceptable time. You know, that's the only way to become the friend of God. The Bible says you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. John 15, 14. I want to be his friend, brothers and sisters. This is what the issue of the ribbon of blue is all about. This is what dress reform and any other reform is all about. Do we know God? Do you want to know him? I want to know him. What do you say? Amen. So now, my brothers and sisters, it says, many go away after listening to the most solemn message of truth and pursue the same careless, unsanctified course they did before as though they had not heard the appeal of God to them. It says... They go away and live to, to please themselves, live to suit their own fancy and in a way directly opposed to the way and will of God. We should not seek to follow our own way. We have had enough of that. Amen. It amounts only to what? That's not, why do we want to do our own thing? We have seen what our life has become doing our own thing. It's true. We see our characters. We see our children. We see our own institutions. We see what we have done. But this says we need to have the Holy Spirit of God with us. How? Moment, moment by moment. And where we are to find our soul's consolation in a happy flight of feeling, oh no, we are by faith to partake of the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby, becoming partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world. How? Through what? Lust. Watch now. It says, I want to know more and more of God's word. Do you want to know more of God's word? Yes or no? That's what BTI is about. And of his works. I do not want to build myself up in myself for I am what? Nothing. Have I felt the necessity of cleansing my heart from all impurity? It is of the greatest importance to understand and what else? Practice, Practice the truth for this sanctifies the soul. Amen. Our greatest anxiety should be to stand perfect before the Lord, clothed in the spotless garments of Christ's Christ. righteousness. Now, my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, I'll do that next week. Mm. I don't disagree, but I'll just do it next week. Now, do you know that there was a man that said, let it be in a more convenient season. You remember that man? Yeah. The apostle Paul was preaching. Yeah. He said, not at this time. Let it be a more convenient time. You know, that time never came for that man. That man died a lost, a lost soul because the time is not tomorrow. It's now. And guess what God has told us? Evidence in every field of knowledge tells us something very important. That a crisis is coming. 2025, what? what plus or minus. Why plus or minus? Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little after. In other words, God doesn't give us an exact date. But he helps us to understand the seasons of where we are. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more today. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you heard of something before? We're going to, we're going to see this now. This says, the present of the time overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What type of men? Thinking men. You should notice my memory now. <clears throat> Thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed where? Upon the... Amen. So, intelligent men and women are looking at events. That are taking place all about us. They are watching the strain, restless relations that exist among the what? Nations. So we should be able to look at the nations and see this. But notice now. They observe the intensity that has taken possession of what? Every you know, it was this earth. statement that made me start studying every field of knowledge. Mm. This particular statement. Mm. Because I looked at that statement and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm. Probably after looking at it more than 100, probably more than 500 times of reading this statement, literally. After reading it, the Holy Spirit opened my mind and I said, wait a minute, Lord, this says... 
This says, they observe the intensity that is taking, talking about the thinking men. They observe the intensity of taking possession of what? Every, every earthly, earthly element. element. That means everything on earth. So I said, wait a minute, Lord, that, that's talking about every field of knowledge. So that means that we should be able to go to every field of knowledge and actually see this. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yeah. And every field of knowledge, whether we're dealing with politics or economy or history or science or anthropology, it all tells us 2025 plus or that a crisis is coming. Look what it says. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earth element, element and they recognize. What do they recognize? That something great, not small, but great and what else? Decisive is not far away. It says it's about to take place that not America or China or India alone, but that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. That tells us then that the thinking men, by looking at evidences all over the world, sees that a global crisis is on foot right now, just before the world comes to an end. Now, if we're nearing the limit, what should we see developing in the world? Now, if we're nearing the limit, what should we see developing in the world? A global crisis. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have we seen that? Oh, yes. Now, something has happened in the last few days, right after we left camp meeting. Something happened in the last few days. I mean, I mean just exactly what we were studying. All over the news that, that is overshadowing the news even to this day. You know what it is? Talk to me, somebody. FBI raided somebody. Talk to me. Who did they raid? Don't say, oh, oh they raided the roaches. No, 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 no. That's not the raid I'm talking about. They raid who? Talk to me, somebody. Who? Mr. Trump. Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. That FBI raid on Mr. Trump. And, and notice, what year did it happen? Talk to me, somebody. You better understand that this means something. This means something. And I want us to talk about it. You want to study it? Yes. Because listen, the handwriting, guess what? Is on the wall. Now, we're still studying the ribbon of blue. Don't think we left. <laughs> we're still studying the ribbon of blue. But we'll come back to that in more detail. Now, my brothers and sisters, God has given us something. You know what he's given us? A crosshair. Now, why does a shooter, why does a man who's uh, 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 hunting, hunting, why does a man who's hunting have a, a scope with a crosshair on it? What's the purpose of that scope? To look nice? What's the purpose? It's to help him to have what? Accuracy. So now, my brothers and sisters, God has given us a spiritual scope. The eyes of the church, the prophet, Amen. the ancient prophets of the Bible, Amen. the modern prophet of the spirit of prophecy, all prophets, Amen. the eyes of God's church. Yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, that is a scope that if we see it, it will allow us to have accuracy in what we're talking about. So if we say that the thinking men see a crisis in 2025, plus or minus, what are they looking at? They're looking at evidence. They're looking at every field of knowledge. They're looking at human resources. They're looking at population. They're looking at climate. They're looking at economy. They're looking at history. They're looking at anthropology. They're looking all over the place. And my brothers and sisters, but do you know that you and I and the, and the remnant church can look at the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and the prophets and say, you know, these men are right on target. You see, brothers and sisters, 2020 wasn't accidental. 2022 is not accidental. Where we are is we're going to see as we study today. And we're going to find out that 2025 plus or a little less, a little more is a time of a global crisis. Not only historically, we're going to see it uh, applies also from the Bible. Now, you know what that is right there? Did you read that? What does that say? Best, best buy. buy. Not best buy. <laughs> but best buy. Buy, buy what? December 3rd. What's that? Anybody know what that is? What do you, what do you call that? You call that an expiration date. Now, do you know that when a person goes to the store and they see an expiration date, they don't look at them and say, oh, these time setters. <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that. You know what they say? It's that, oh, you know, I'm going to keep that in my mind. Make sure. And then they go to every now and then they go to the refrigerator. And if they don't have it, they can't see it, they put the glasses on. Am I right? <laughs> and they look at it. And there are some people I know, some people I know, that the moment that it passes the expiration date, they boom, they throw it away. But expiration dates are, guess what? Plus or minus. You know that an expiration date, that sometimes the food, now we're going to show you that literally, the food is sometimes still good. And the, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, they say this. What, what I'm telling you, they tell you. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. That sometimes the food lasts longer than the expiration date. And sometimes it expires before the expiration date. And the only way you can know 
Now, that expiration date puts you at the, uh, the, the generate, uh, excuse me, that expiration date mm. puts you at about the time. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? Yes. Doesn't give you the day and the hour, but it puts you at about the time, but then you look a little closer. Mm. Now, I want to ask you a question. What if a person had a, a, a carton of milk, and they're getting ready to drink this, and let, let me put some orange juice, let me use orange juice, and put like orange juice. And they're getting ready to drink the orange juice, and, the, and they look at the expiration date, and the expiration date says, uh, 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 November 18, 2022. That's still the future, am I right? Yeah. November 18, 2022. And they look at it, oh, well, I, well this is not expired. We're still, still good. And he opens it up, and boom, on the top of it, he sees green fuss. Mm-hmm. And a smell come out. Mm-hmm. Does he say, well, it says we have a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to that man? You say that man's unintelligent. You say that man's a fool. You would say that man's a foolish virgin. Now, my brothers and sisters, no expiration date. Do you eat it or you throw it away? away. But there's no expiration date. Sheila, look, she even, she got the smile. (laughs) Sheila, no expiration date. Do you eat that? No, she's not eating that. She's not eating it. And and she's not not wrong not to eat it. She's intelligent. Maybe her parents taught her. (laughs) So now, my brothers and sisters, you don't eat that. Even if the date says you got a little longer, you know, no, that's minus, brother. That's minus, sister. So what do you do in 2022? What do you do in 2022 if you see the green fuss? Do you say, well, we still have a little more time. God is a patient, long-suffering God, and he's just going to come any time. Is that what you say? Not if you're intelligent. If you're intelligent, you understand, well, what is this green fuzz? And today, we're going to study a little bit about this green fuzz. Are you with me? Let's come to the Lord before we go deeper into the heart of our study. Oh, come, let us kneel. Let us bow down before the Lord, our maker. Oh, Father in heaven, if ever we needed a relationship with you, we need it now. Lord, it, it's beautiful to have a relationship with you, even if we had a thousand years. Hmm. And yet it is essential, Lord, that if we don't have it now, we will never be able to get it. Hmm. Help us to see, Lord, that we have no more time in which to sit back and do nothing. There has to be a radical change. Hmm. And we cannot do this without Christ. There has to be a work of preparation. And any church we go to, it should be a church that helps us to prepare. Hmm. We should not sit down fashionably at a place just so that we can go and say we were there because we're supposed to be there, we should go to a place where the messages are preparing us for what is soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. And then to be used to reach out to help other church members, to help others in the community and the world so that they too can find a relationship with Christ and in his way of life that will prepare us before it is too late. Lord, as we continue in the study of the ribbon of blue into this little section the handwriting on the wall for today. We pray, Lord, that you will open up our minds and hearts, that we will hear your appeal, that no longer will we stay in this gap of knowing something but not doing it, which is sin. But that we will say, Lord, today, help me to hear your voice and not harden my heart, but to obey by your power. Lord, we come to you right now. Please remove me. I'm fickle. I'm feeble. I'm frail. Speak to me and to us as we study this handwriting on the wall. Abide with us now, we pray, and we thank you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to jump to the heart of our study this morning, to the book of Daniel. What book did I say? Daniel. We're going to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. If ever there was a book to study in the last days, it's the book of Daniel. We're told that the book of Daniel and Revelation should be understood as never before in the history of our work. Go to Daniel, chapter 5. And one of the reasons why this is so important is because that never in the history of our world has there been a generation that has evidence as clear as our generation of an approaching crisis. Now, do you know that in every generation there has been a crisis? You know that, don't you? You don't call the final crisis of the Sunday law the final crisis because it's the first crisis. You call it the final crisis because there was a crisis before that and a crisis before that. You will find in the Bible that in every generation there is a crisis. But the final current generation is the worst crisis such as never was to hit this planet. Now, 
Every generation has evidence before crisis comes. That's just the nature of God. He's a loving God. And love warns before it allows a crisis. Does that make sense? Before the crisis of the flood, what did God do? He sent a messenger called Noah. And Noah warned of that approaching crisis. Did he not? Did everybody prepare? They did not. And as a result, many of them, the majority of them were lost. But it wasn't because there was not a message of preparation, a message of warning. God always warns. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? Was there a crisis? Did God prepare them for the crisis? Did God send messengers, human and heavenly, pulling literally Lot and his family out by the hands and still the majority of the family didn't make it? Now, my brothers and my sisters, this is telling us that God in every generation, I could go down the list and continue. But my brothers and sisters, do you know that this generation has more evidence than all of those generations combined? Now, you say, what do I mean? Now, look, every generation has signs. God gave signs to every generation. But do you know that in the final generation, not only has God given us clear signs, but also the signs of those generations. So they had their signs of their generation, but they didn't have the signs of the other generation. But the final generation can take all these generations and look at their signs and look at their evidences and look at their destruction. And then look at our signs and our evidence and combine all of it and say, Lord, this is the word of the Lord to me. Admonition upon whom the ends of the world are. All of this is written for us. And yet still we don't learn. You know, one of the things that was learned from history is that we don't learn from history. Isn't that a sad thing? Now, my brothers and sisters, in Daniel chapter five, we have a history. Of what's going on now. I mean, look, is the evidence not clear that we're approaching the crisis right now? You know, in Colorado, there's a water basin in Colorado. Over 50 percent less water than they had two years ago. They said it threatens the ability for the people in Arizona and the people in uh, 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 Texas and the people in in Colorado to even have enough water. They have to be uh, on a, a limitation of how much water they can use. Same is going on in California. With the energy, with the heat going up and, and, and index, and they're saying, look, we've got to use less energy because the bill is too, too much for the grid to be able to handle. We see crisis happening. Restrictions of resources, famine, water, everywhere, just what God said. We look at every line in every field of knowledge, we see the handwriting on the wall, politically, economically, socially, religiously, environmentally, every way you turn. And God is saying, please, why don't we listen to the messenger, prepare To do what we know so that we can become the friend of God. In Daniel chapter 5, we have an evidence of one of these handwritings that were on the wall. Look at verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Let's pick up in verse 1. You know the story. Let's read together. It says, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Verse 2. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels. Did they bring them? Yes or no? Verse 3. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, which is a very deep point, but we don't have time to study that. They drank out of them. Verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and stone. Were they solemn or were they careless? Careless. Can you imagine them watching Netflix? I mean, they're just sitting on the couch watching Netflix, one after the other. You can just see them throwing popcorn in their mouth. You can just see them just playing the music. You can see everything in the world happening And then all of a sudden, something changes the course of history. In verse 5, the Bible says, in the same hour came forth, what everybody? Fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. You know, the Bible says his countenance changed. You know, that, that once proud king and boastful king, who is this God? He now sees that bloodless hand and his courage escapes him. All of a sudden, his knees begin to knock. My teacher used to call it the Belshazzar knock. He just, 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 he just, he can't, he can't even help himself. The Bible says that his loins were loosed. You know, that was, let me just make it plain. When it says loins was loose, he used the bathroom on himself. That's what the Bible was saying. The man used the bathroom on himself. He was so afraid. You know, when a dog gets afraid or a snake gets afraid or any animal gets afraid, you know what they do? They use the bathroom. And do you know that when man gets afraid, you know what he does too? He releases the bowels. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this man, you know, I'm telling you something. You know, every seven evidence now, every, you can see the majority of seven evidence today, even if a man's sincere, he may act like, well, you know, I don't care about the Sunday law and the time of trouble. You know, I'll do what I want. I, 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 I don't care about this. I'm telling you something. When that Sunday law is passed, mm. not one seven evidence will say so. Not one Adventist child, not one adult. Every child will wake up. Video game, be throwing that thing down. He, he kill us. He's now interested not in Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook. He's interested do I know Jesus? Mm. But for the Seventh-day Adventists, at that time, it will be too late. This is why we got to be choked. 
spiritually choke. So God can get us to run smoothly. Not through just literally choking us, but by helping us to get a grip. Am I taking life serious? What should a prophet of man to gain the whole world then to do what? Lose his soul. Now, my brothers and sisters, this happened. He was gripped, and in a little while, the world will be gripped, as well as seven heavens, old and young alike. And the Bible says, then verse 6, then the king's countenance was changed. No longer was he acting brave now. His thoughts troubled him. He had a time of trouble. So that the joints, joints of his loins were what? You know what that means now, don't you? And his knees smote one against another. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's the uh, Belshazzar not. Uh, Bel uh, Belshazzar uh, not. Now, he saw something that was written on the wall. Anybody remember what was written on the wall? There was an expression. He didn't just do that. There was an expression. What was the expression? Talk to me. I, I, I saw a little sister back. What's your name, sister? Bianna. All right. What's, uh, what's, what, what, what's, what's my sister's name again? Gianna. Oh, that's, that's nice. Brianna and Gianna. <laughs> All right. Now, what was written on the wall was an expression. What was, does anybody remember? Any, any young person remember what the expression was? Shiloh. You remember what the expression was that was written? Micah? Many, many, what else? Tekel, your farce. Let's say it together. Many, many, tekel, your farce. Now, when Belshazzar saw it, he did not understand what that meant. See, it wasn't written in Hebrew. It wasn't written in the Chaldean language. Daniel interpreted many so that he could understand it, but that's not what it was. The language was a godly language. They didn't know anything about it. Now, my brothers and sisters, they looked at it. They knew something meant it was serious. I mean, imagine if you saw a hand, a bloodless hand come in and start writing on the wall. You say, now, uh, Elder Smokey. <laughs> I said, now, who, who, who did you have in this church last? If I came in, I, I mean, some, 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 some stuff was going on in here. So that man, he recognized this is not normal. He didn't know what it meant, but he knew it wasn't normal. Now, my brothers and sisters, they call in Daniel. You know the story. I don't have time to go through the history. That's a familiar story. He comes back in. Now, Daniel is brought in to solve this problem of the highest nation of the world. And when he comes in, the king says, what does it mean? And Daniel reads, many, many take your farms. And watch what Daniel says. Let's skip the story. Go down to Daniel 5. You can read it when you get home. Look at verse 24. You're there, amen? amen. <clears throat> verse 24 together. It says, then, are you there, Amen was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Well, what was it? Verse 25. And this is the writing that was written, many, many, tekel, your farce. And now, many is double. And in the Bible, something is double, not because it's a different word. It emphasizes, when, jo when Joseph had uh, interpreted the dream for Pharaoh, Pharaoh had two dreams, one of the fat cows, one of the fat corn. One of the skinny cows, one of the skinny corn. Those two dreams were not two different dreams. Joseph's interpretation in Genesis 41, he said that the, the, the two dreams are one and they were double because the thing is shortly to come to pass. Mm. In other words, it is a symbol of urgency when God repeats it. Mm. So if he said many, many, whatever many is, it meant that urgently that word is getting ready to happen. Mm. So now, my brothers and sisters, we need to find out what does many mean? We need to go back now and understand what does many mean? Now, it's right there in the text. Anybody know what many meant? Talk to me, somebody. Anybody know what it meant? Well, if you don't know, let's just read it then. If you don't know, you, don't, you, you sound like, well, I don't know Hebrew. It was not Hebrew. You know? well, let's go a little further. It says in verse 26, it says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Many. What does it mean? Talk to me, somebody. God have numbered thy kingdom. So the word many means what? Two things. That word means two things. Number one, God have what? Numbered. Has numbered thy kingdom. Give me another name for number. Of, uh, give me another name for kingdom, rather. Nation. God has numbered thy kingdom. And what's the last part of the word mean? What does that mean? Someone says done. That's right. <laughs> In other words, if it says that thy, that, that thy kingdom is numbered, that means that there is an allotted what? There's a lot of time that God has given a number to how long your kingdom would reign and control the earth. So Babylon was not ruling indiscriminately. Babylon was ruling for a period of time. It had an expiration date. Babylon itself had an expiration date. Do you know that God said that the Babylonians would only have captivity of his people for 70 years? Plus or minus. <laughs> 
70 years, he said, that they're going to be in control of, uh, 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 of the people of God, Babylon, and 70 years to the number it happened, just as God said. Why? Because the kingdom is what? Talk to me, somebody. Number. Thy kingdom is numbered, but not only numbered, because it's possible to have an allotted time. And imagine right now. This is what Jeremiah said to some of the people that were saying when Babylon came, they're only going to rule for two years and then you're going to come on right on back. Babylon, Jeremiah said, don't believe him. God says 70 years, don't believe him. And he, he, first he had a wooden uh, yoke, he put on a metal yoke and said, break that off. They couldn't break it. So they broke, they see, some, some false prophets came up and broke the wooden yoke off of Jeremiah and said, look, just as we broke that yoke, we're going to be able to break the, the captivity of, uh, of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar and Jerusalem, uh, uh, of Babylon. And, Nebuch and God said, no, no. So Jeremiah said, I, I, I got something for him. He put a metal yoke on. <laughs> they came to that metal yoke. Guess what you can't, you can't, you can't break that metal yoke. He said, just as that was so, that's how the captivity will be. You won't be able to break it until God says the allotted time has come to an end. Now, my brothers and sisters, now tell me something. What, what if it was the third year of Babylon's reign? Is it time for it to come down? No. Has it reached its expiration date? No. But now, what if I come to the 60th year? Are we getting close? Yes or no? Yes. But when you know I come to the 70th year, I've come to the limit. That kingdom is numbered and is finished. Are you following? So what this many, many were saying is, number one, Babylon, you have ruled as long as God has given you a power to rule, and now your kingdom is getting ready to come down. Many, many, because it's shortly getting ready to take place. And that very night, mm. that very night, the expir expiration date was reached. Mm. Now, my brothers and sisters, all of these things are left on record for us, but you know what happens? We read the stories of the Bible as if they have nothing to do with us in this last generation. Oh, that's a nice bedtime story to tell to a little Micah and to a little Sela and to a little Amaya. That's such a nice story for Brianna and all the rest. But no, this is for you and I to prepare our homes for what's about to take place. Now, my brother and sister, watch now. There is a what? There is a what? There is a what? Now, we look at these quotations many times, so I'm not trying to really study that. We've studied this before. What I'm trying to show us is over and over again through the spirit of prophecy. You see the word. You can just look up the phrase, there's a limit, and find hundreds. Reference at the reference at the reference at the reference telling us that God has a limit. But it's amazing. Then somebody says, well, I wonder what that means. <laughs> well, it means God has a what? <laughs> limit. And this limit applies not just to an individual but to nations. Look at what inspiration says uh, in education. Mm. Page 178, it says, the history of what? Nation. Not nation, Babylon. It says nation, that one after another have occupied their allotted time. Now, that tells me something if I'm studying correctly, if I'm studying deeply. You know what that tells me? Every nation has a limit of how long it can last. It says the history, not of a nation, of nations, talking about the world, that one after another have occupied their allotted time. And what else? I wonder then, does Babylon have an allotted time? Yes or no? Yes. Medio Persia doesn't have an allotted time. Greece didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. Pagan Rome didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. Papal Rome didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. 1260 years, a lot of time. And then the deadly wound. America yeah. doesn't have an allotted time. Yeah. Now it's amazing that we see all these other nations have this allotted time. And then we come to America. Oh, well, America doesn't have an expiration date because it's America. We're in the West. <laughs> That's what Russia is saying. That the rest, the West has no idea. There's a, 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 a boldness that the West has that's, that savors on foolishness. Mm. Now, I'm not in agreement with Putin. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't agree with his position. I'm trying to explain that the world recognizes that the West is not thinking straight. Mm. And the East have been confused by the West. <laughs> well, that's another study. But it says that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place unconsciously. Witnessing to the truth of which they themselves, what? Yeah. Knew not. So do you know that sometimes a person, historian, the writer says something but doesn't know what he's saying. It says, speaks to us. So though it's written, it speaks to us. Though it's the history of those nations, it speaks to us. It says to how many nations? Every nation. So what this is talking about a lot of time applies to how many nations? Every. To every nation and to every individual of, of today, God has assigned a what? Place in his great Plan. Today, many nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny and God is what? Overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. So now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, 
The prophet says that every nation has an allotted time. My question is, does the Bible say that? Because what we're studying here is that everything that is written in the prophet's writings are in the Bible. And everything that the Bible says, the prophet says, and everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Do you believe that? Yeah. Well, then you're almost a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> now, notice what the Bible says in Acts 17. Let's, let's see from the Bible. Go to Acts 17 quickly now. Go to Acts 17. We're, we're doing a little review to warm our engines up so that next week we can take off firing. But it's just a little warm-up for next week, by the grace of God. Go to Acts 17. And by God's grace, next week we'll be ready to study more deeply. Are you ready? Yes. Acts 17. Go to Acts 17 quickly. Acts 17, we want to pick up now in verse 29. Look at Acts 17 in verse 20. Uh, let's, let's pick up in verse uh, 23. Acts 17, verse 23. You're there, amen? amen? 24, excuse me. Acts 17, verse 24. It says, God that made, what's the next word? The world and all things therein. So what is he talking about now? It's the Bible says God that made the world. So he's dealing not with one nation. He's dealing with what? And the world composes how many nations? All nations. Every nation. So the Bible says God is dealing with all the nations. Watch now. God has made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Jump down to verse 26. Verse 26 says, and have made of how many blood? One blood, what's the next two words? All now question, now God defines what the world is. What does the Bible explain the world is? Talk to me, somebody. All nations. Now, if I deal with all nations, what am I dealing with? Well, I'm dealing with the world. So whatever he's telling us about the world applies to every nation on the world. Because remember now, the prophet says that the history of nations to every nation. So what we're doing is seeing that everything that prophet says, we can go right to the Bible and prove it. See, it's a wonderful thing. When everything you believe is in the word of God. All Seventh-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. And God is trying to help us to understand Bible at BTI, at Bible Training Institute. Now, notice now. It says the world, which is all nations. Uh, let's continue verse 26. And it made of one blood all nations of men for to, talk to me somebody. For to dwell. What does dwell mean? So all nations are to dwell or live for a period of time. Let's see. It says, have determined the, what? Times. Have determined the times before appointed and the Bounds. bounds of the habitation. So concerning all nations of the world, for men to live in it, God has determined two things. What's the first thing he's told us about every nation? They have a time, what? What does the text say? Time, what? Before. Now, that's an important word. Why does it say before? Because what good would it be to say, well, Babylon, you had 70 years after Babylon came on the scene. Well, of course it has 70 years. You saw that already. You know? But he tells us it before it happens. That's prophecy. So God tells us the allotted time before the nations come on the scene. So now my brothers and sisters, as we look at this, he says the time before appointed. And then the last line says, and not only the time before appointed, but also the what? Talk to me, somebody. Bounds. The bounds of what? So the nations have a bound. The world has a bound. What is a bound? A limit. That's where we get our word boundary. What is a boundary? A limit. Now, I want to give you a biblical definition of boundary because we're talking about Bible training. What is a biblical definition of a bound? Let's notice Jeremiah chapter 5. What book did I say? Jeremiah. We're going to Jeremiah 5. Now, do we bring the microphone? Yeah. Jeremiah 5. Okay, Elder, you're going to pick us up now. Jeremiah 5. If you'll read this for us in Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. And again, the microphone is not to project your voice here, but for the recording. There are many watching all over the world. And they've been on us. You know what they said to us? They said, the last couple of Fridays, you haven't put BTI out. And they're upset. <laughs> they, 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 get, they get me all over the world. They tell me, you got to put it back on. But, but look at Jeremiah 5. Look at Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. And we want to know what bound is. Jeremiah 5, beginning in verse 22. Now, remember, we don't have to explain anything. The Bible, I'm not saying one word. The Bible is explaining itself, what is a bound? Jeremiah 5, Elder, would you read for us verse 22, please? <clears throat> Jeremiah, excuse me, Jeremiah 5, 22. Fear ye not me, saith the, saith the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence, which hath placed the sand for the bound? Wait a minute, Elder. It said he placed the sand for a what? Bound. Now, we can look at nature and understand what a bound is so we can apply it to nations. Now, if we look at nature, the sand is the bound 
for the sea. Now watch what it says a bound is. Continue. Uh, have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass. Wait a minute now. It says that a bound is something that what? Talk to me somebody. Cannot pass. That they cannot pass. So in three words we can say a bound is something that they, I would put cannot what? Pass. Cannot pass. That is what a bound is. Something that you cannot what? Pass. That's what a boundary is for. You, you put a boundary on the line, you say this far, no further. Don't pass that. Now look, look at the Let's continue a little further. Let's continue. What does the text go on to say? And though the waves thereof toss themselves. Now what does it mean they toss themselves? What are the waves trying to do? What are they trying to do? Trying the waves to are trying. If the bound wasn't there, they would pass it. It says they toss them, or waves toss themselves. Continue. Yet can they not prevail? So if they prevail, it's not a bound. If they prevail, it's not a bound because they did pass it. Are you following? It says that they cannot prevail. Continue. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over. So a bound is something that you cannot pass. And even if you try to pass it, you cannot pass it. That's what a bound is. So now my brother and sister, now I didn't make that up. That's a biblical definition of bound. So if the nations have a bound, that means that a nation could try to pass it. He may have the mightiest army in this world. He may have the greatest scientists and technicians. He may have the greatest wisdom and of all the wise men combined. And still, he cannot pass it. So my brothers and sisters, does it matter what generation he's in? If God has an allotted time, we need to find out what that is. Does, does it make sense, yes or no? Yes. So my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that that is about. Now, watch what the prophet says, almost exact words. Christ Object Lessons 177, this relief book. It says, what's the first two words? The world. The world. Exactly what we found from the Bible. The world has become bold in transgression of God's law because of his long forbearance. Is God patient and forbearing? Yes or no? Yes. Men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage. Saying, how does God know? How does God know that there's a limit? Well, he's God. <laughs> it says, but <clears throat> there is a what? Line. Beyond which they cannot. Where is that from? Talk to me somebody. Bible. There is a line which they cannot pass. The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. So another word for bound is what? Talk to me, somebody. Limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at this now. What is a prescribe? What does prescribe mean? What is a scribe? What is a scribe? Somebody who what? Writes. What is pre? Before. Before. So a prescribed limit is a limit that was given before. before. So what did Acts say? The time, what? Before appointed. So everything that prophet says, you can go right back to the Bible and show is right there in the word of God. My brothers and sisters, God has given a prescribed limit to every nation. Even now, they have almost exceeded the wow. bounds of the long suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his mercy. The Lord will. What does interpose mean? Step in. My brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us that God has given us a bound in which we cannot pass. Every nation has an allotted time. Did we prove that from the word of God? Yes or no? Yes. Now, my brothers and sisters. If a nation has an appointed time that it cannot pass, it will make sense to know what that is. Right? Go to Matthew 24. What book did I say? Matthew. We'll notice that Jesus applies this not only to the generations at the first coming, but the generations in the Old Testament. He applies this to the generation just before the coming of the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and notice how the Bible puts it in beginning in verse 3. Matthew chapter 24. You remember that Jesus was speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. And it shook up the disciples. And so they asked him a question in verse 3. Matthew 24 verse 3 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And what else, everybody? Amen. The end of the world. Did Jesus tell them, yes or no? Yes. He gave them signs. Look at verse 32. Jump down to verse 32. Would you pass the microphone to Elder Tony, please? Verse 32. Would you read that for us, brother? Look at verse 32. Let's read that loud and clear. Verse 32. Notice what Christ says now concerning the signs. Matthew 24 and verse 32 states, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you ye know. Right. Not guess you what? No. Now if we know something, we should do something about what we know. Am I right? Mm, that's right. Now watch. He said, you know that summer is what? Is nigh. Is nigh. What does nigh mean? Yeah. Near. All right, Sister Melissa, verse 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see Stop all... Stop for a moment. 
It says, so like ye, so likewise ye, when you shall, what's that next word? See. I'm going to ask you a question. That word see, does it mean invisible or visible? Visible. 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 I'm going to put that right on the side. So, we can, <laughs> so when we're talking about noticing what's getting ready to take place, God has given us evidence that we can see. He has given us evidence that we can see. Do you know that God gave evidence over 100 years before Babylon failed of evidence that they could actually see? Daniel knew what was happening. Can you imagine? And Isaiah, over 100 years before a Cyrus was ever born, God called Cyrus by name and said he was going to take down Babylon. God said that Cyrus would come through the two leave gates in Babylon by name. 100 years before it ever took place. Now, my brothers and sisters, Daniel had the book of Isaiah. Daniel studied this prophecy. It was the prophet Isaiah that warned that Babylon was going to take them eunuchs over 112 years before. Same prophet. Now, my brothers and sisters, can you imagine now, Daniel reads Cyrus, and all of a sudden he reads in the newspaper. <laughs> he reads in the newspaper. He sees on the media. And it says, Cyrus is coming to town. Why? Daniel knows what that means. He looks at the seven-year period. He looks at the expiration date. But he doesn't need to see the expiration date anymore because he sees Cyrus. He sees the green fuss. And now he doesn't even have to wonder. He looks at Cyrus and said, that is the man that's getting ready to do this. It's time. It's time. Now, my brother and sister, do you know that everybody else who didn't believe the prophets, they would have looked at the same event and said, Babylon has never fallen. Babylon had a gate. Can you imagine? 87 foot thick. Can you imagine that, that, that they could ride chariots on top of the gate of Babylon? They could ride four chariots at a time around Babylon side by side, bigger than any high superhighway that we have today. Babylon was highly, uh, highly modernized. They had aqueducts. Mm -hmm. They had hanging gardens. They had inside uh, uh, aquariums. They, 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 they had everything that you think about in the world today. Satan made Babylon like a counterfeit heaven. It was a counterfeit in New Jerusalem. The city, you, you see the river, like the river Euphrates, went straight through the city, just like the New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You read everything about it, you say, Satan was trying to plan on earth what he saw in heaven and perverted my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. They had enough food that they could have fed the enemies that tried to, they could have, they were, in fact, they wanted to throw food out to them. Because, you know, normally you put a siege to destroy a nation. Mm -hmm. They said, you're not going to destroy us, we got food in here, you're not going, you can't, we don't, we don't care about this. But they had no idea that no matter how much power they had, God had already prophesied their allotted time. And what Babylon was yesterday, America is today. Now, my brothers and sisters, Daniel knew when he saw that Cyrus from a child, he understood what that meant. It's time to make an exodus. It's time to go free. Now, my brothers and sisters, so likewise, verse 33 says, when you shall see how much, how much all these things don't guess, but what? Know that it is near. How near? Talk to me, somebody. So God tells us that we should be able to look at the visible signs in the nations, in the world, and by looking at them to know that the coming of Christ is near. How near? Even at the door. What does that mean? If I said a man's at the door, you say that's close. Yeah. What if I said right now, a man with a gun is at the door, Brianna, what would you do? You said, well, man, you said run. Well, you couldn't run too far. <laughs> <laughs> by the grace of God, if I saw him, I'm going to do him before he get to you. Amen. <laughs> but, but what it said, but, 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 but what it's telling us is, that when you see someone at the door, you know it's close. But the Bible is trying to give us something very clearly. We studied it here in our class. What does it mean, at the door? What's the next word of verse 34? The Bible explains. In verse 34, it tells us what it means. What's the very first word of verse 34? Verily. Now, verily is not a word that's used carelessly in the Bible. You remember Jesus speaking to Nicodemus and he said, you must be born again. Nicodemus tried to act like he didn't know what God meant. He knew what he meant. But he, how can a man, when he's old, go back into his mother's womb? That doesn't happen. But Nicodemus understood. You know that the, the Israelites, the children of Israel, they actually baptized people back then. Mm -hmm. Converts, they, they used the, 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 the symbol of baptism. John the Baptist was going around doing what? Baptizing. How did he mean? He was a master in Israel. He didn't know. He knew. But he was trying to act like he didn't know, sometimes like us. God can tell us things. Mm. And we know mm. what we're supposed to do. But then we well, I don't know if I should eat that. Or well, at least we bought so much. Let's just eat it until it's finished. Mm. It's amazing when we become conservatives. You know, <laughs> It's amazing what, what, what we want to do, but, but it, it doesn't apply that way. God is trying to tell us what we know we should put into practice, we should do. Now, my brothers and sisters, God is trying to show us something here of what it means to literally be at the door. Verily, what he said to Nicodemus was, he said again, okay, you don't know what I mean? Let me, let me make it plain. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, 
Except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He did not change his subject. He just made it more clear, more emphatic of a certainty. This is what I mean. So when Jesus said that we can see signs that would know the season, just like we can look into the world and know that it's coming is near. How near? Even at the door. Someone says, well, I don't know what it means to be at the door. Is there a literal door in heaven? That's not what God is talking about. Verily, if you don't understand what I mean, let me make it clear, emphatic, plain. What it means to be at the door, verse 34 says, verily I say unto you. Let's read it. Verily I say unto you what? This, this generation, generation, wait a minute now, shall not pass. Now where do we hear that word before? Limits. So shall not pass is a bound. So the Bible is telling us this is the thing that we can see. We can see events that will show us the nation coming to a time that he cannot pass. But this is not just one nation. This is talking about the world. What shall be the sign of that coming and the end of the world? So that means that the world has a limit it cannot pass. Now, what generation do we call that? The first generation or the limit generation? The first generation or the last generation? The first generation or the final generation? So the Bible is telling us that we should be able to see signs in the nation, visible signs, that we can look at a nation and the nations of the world and recognize this is when that nation is getting ready to collapse. And if it's the last nation of the world, like America is, we should be able to say, this is the time when the world is going to collapse. That the world cannot pass this. And this is not the first generation. This is the final generation. Are we in that generation right now? Yes or no? Yes. I'm telling you we are. And I'm telling you 2025 plus or minus tells us this. Now, we don't have the time to go through all the evidence. But Shiloh, we're watching this. Not back there. We're watching this.